Good to know we're the great minds. We're in sort of a revolutionary time for creative. What is the solution? Where can you go? Try and do something different. You can get to 8 million people like that, and those are 8 million people that actually want to hear what you have to say. It's a conversation between everyone. And if you're not up for the conversation, then forget it or be lucky. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next panel, Bloomberg is Disruption, presented by Bloomberg Media. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Sherman, uh, Bloomberg's tech media telecom uh, M&A reporter. Um, and we're going to talk about advertising. Uh, Specifically, disruption. Um, I will let uh, my esteemed panel here introduce themselves because uh, I always think that they do a better job, people do a better job introducing themselves than uh, a moderator can do. Go ahead, Lucian. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Lucien Boyer. I'm the global CEO of Havas Sports Entertainment, part of Havas Media Group. We're in the Havas family, um, and we are really specializing in brand engagement. And our disruption was to break the commercial break and starting to engage people outside of the advertising. Uh, Don Kennedy, um, president of Advertiser Platforms with uh, AOL, um, or Verizon now, it's still a little odd to say. Uh, really head up uh, our product strategy and revenue strategy for all of our uh, ad technology products. Hi, everyone. I'm Janet Holian, and I am CMO of DraftKings. If you haven't heard of DraftKings, I'd be surprised. But um, <laughs> we are weekly and daily fantasy sports. I'm Kathleen Saxton. I'm the CEO and founder of The Lighthouse Company in London and New York. And even though I'm mostly in London, I've even heard of DraftKings. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor Fellows, CRO of The Wall Street Journal. Um, so I figured I would start with a few broad questions for everybody, and then we'll sort of get into more specific questions toward uh, what these people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So since this is a panel about disruption, maybe we can just go in the same order you guys introduced yourselves. Just tell us the biggest force that's going to disrupt your job in the next, say, year or two? What are you going to be doing differently a year or two from now than you're doing today? Well, <clears throat> I think we are in a world where um, people uh, don't really have the patience to keep on focusing on what you try to tell them, so they decide and they choose. So what, really, what we need to do is to uh, make sure that the consumers are ready to engage with anything we create, which is really meaningful to them, and that is going to be more and more complicated because of the, 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 the new mobile um, um, apps that are created every day. So I think that the big thing for us is really to keep uh, updated on everything that is not existing today. And I think the biggest disruptor is what, has, what we don't know, what has not been launched already. And as an example, Snapchat is really doing such an amazing job on the teens. And none of us here in this room, I think, knew anything about Snapchat two years ago. So I guess it's the next, next Snapchat. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, at AOL being both focused on the, uh, the, the content business as well as the ad technology business, I, I think to what Lucian was saying about uh, the consumer is critical. And, you know, we launched a product the other evening uh, with Verizon called Go90 that uh, really addresses that and, and the, the consumer taking control of what defines their content experience, especially around things like TV and the impact that, uh, that devices uh, are having on that consumption uh, and people's viewing patterns and, and how they behave online. And I think from the B2B side of things, um, you know, it, it's, it's providing value in a world where brands are starting to just become more savvy and more educated and more involved in the whole buying and uh, supply process as well. Uh, and sort of where is the role of the agency, uh, you know, in the future in that, in that process, particularly in the ad technology space, is a, is, a, uh, is, a, is a dynamic that's evolving in real time and could be very different within the next, uh, you know, 12 to 24 months. Yeah, at DraftKings, what I would say is it's only a three-year-old company, so we're quite new. Um, and we're really already disrupting an industry and building an industry all around fantasy sports. Uh, and so we launch new fantasy sports all the time. Uh, we launched uh, this past week around esports, which is a you know, fast and growing area. Uh, and we'll continue to disrupt uh, in all the different sporting venues that we can. 
Uh, we also have great technology and are always on the forefront of making sure we have the best apps, the best experience for our customers. So it's just a constant disruption when you're in a space that's growing as rapidly as ours is. So for the Lighthouse, we specialize in finding the leaders of industry, particularly in our particular sector of industry. And I'm also a psychotherapist. So my view is, you know, the challenge for our businesses is how do we find the talent that's going to be able to lead some of this disruption through and understand it? And how do we support that talent through doing that? Because it's not easy and the pressure is even more immense that we're seeing with the CEOs that we represent. The other thing I'd say, I think, is geographically people are much more willing to move and take risk. And I think you're finding agency leaders and, and client CMOs and commercial leaders of businesses on the media owner side all willing and happy to move across disciplines. So this lateral movement is a great challenge, but it's also a great disruptor. I think it's really interesting. I think it's very hard to look at two years and think about what will be disrupting us then. I do think that disruption takes quite a long time to work through the system. And I think if you look at a couple of things that have happened in the last six months, um, the precipitous fall in broadcast ratings and the extraordinary emergence of ad blockers, their impact is going to take quite a long time to work through, but it's going to be very profound. So there's no doubt they are going to be disrupting our businesses, all of our businesses. Um, as to what I'd like to be disrupting us, um, in an ideal world, it will be the sort of the congruence of client and the people we're hiring bringing new ways of business together. So I want to pick up on that theme, and it touches also on what Lucian and Kathleen just said, to sort of this idea that... It's hard to predict, in a way, you know, what the next Snapchat is going to be. Do, do we have the right people running the show in this business? In other words, is, are the leadership in touch or out of touch with the way advertising and the speed that advertising is progressing? I think my boss is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> what about other people's bosses? <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> I think a good leader is a disruptive leader, but disruption can also be quite destructive. So I think it's about stability in businesses at the same time. But then it all comes back to the same thing, I think, which is about risk profiling. How willing is an individual as a leader prepared to be to take the risks that a business might need it to do? And how does it do that in a way that it doesn't completely disseminate what the business is altogether? So it's getting that balance and that risk profile just about right. And I do worry, and we represent lots of clients from Facebook and Snapchat and Twitter and all sorts of people, the street journal. Um, you know, we often work with those businesses and when they're briefing us on the people that they're looking at running, you know, big sections for them, in the first briefing I can tell how likely we are to find someone who might move those businesses on based on those briefs. And sometimes if the leaders aren't really in touch with what's happening, you're just making a problem worse. So we, are, we have to be quite challenging as headhunters to be sure that they're being brave enough in the way they're briefing these roles out. Don, you, you, you have, I mean, AOL's platform obviously was sort of the crown jewel of why Verizon wanted to buy AOL. Do you feel like you are consistently um, surprised and amazed by the people that are sort of working with AOL's platform, or are you frustrated by the lack of understanding of ad tech and programmatic advertising? No, I think, um, uh, I mean, I love the people I work with, right? Um, and I love all of our clients as well. Um, but, um, but no, I think, um, I think that, you know, again, to the question about talent and leadership, uh, it, it, it's less about who is running, you know, coming up with these ideas, and I think more about the intent that the individual has. And if you look at the ad tech space, um, it's been its own worst enemy for the past, you know, let's just say decade plus, right? And uh, uh, happily, I haven't seen um, Terry Kawaja's Lumiscape. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen it this week. Thankfully, I haven't seen it anywhere. But it's a good representation. And I think if there's value um, to what uh, an entrepreneur is starting or, or a larger corporation is putting out there, if there's truly value behind something, um, then advertisers are going to use it. Clients are going to adopt it. Uh, the question becomes uh, whether something is kind of a cool product or is it a business? And, and that's one of those things where I think we've seen a lot of really cool products come out, but are they scalable long-term businesses? And that's, you know, the, the, the markets have said for, you know, particularly with regards to ad tech, the markets have said, no, you're not, you're not real businesses. If you look at what the public markets have done to so many uh, of the companies in our sector, so I think that there is a, uh, you know, sort of this demystification process that, that we have to go through 
on a daily basis and make sure that we're actually talking to clients in, in real language rather than a bunch of ad tech acronyms that you know, we, we may understand in our hallways but don't necessarily mean something to someone who's you know, trying to sell cereal to millions of consumers on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a great article. It's the cover story of Bloomberg Business Week. It's a plug for Bloomberg, I understand. <laughs> but there's a quote in that story. You should all pick it up if you haven't read it from a veteran ad executive, Bob Hoffman, that says, I can think of nothing that has done more harm to the internet than ad tech. It has cheapened and debased advertising and spawned criminal empires. Do you agree with that general statement? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Don. I mean, you're Janet. Yeah. Uh, now, um, we'll get to Janet. Janet in a and I don't have accents. Yeah. I think yeah. so. We, we, well, um, right. So, um, I think that's you know again. I mean, that's a great quote. Uh, it, you know, don't let the facts get in the way of a great story, right? Is that the one, one of the sayings? I think it's a it's an interesting, provocative quote. Uh, and I think that you could say that uh, that it's spawned. You know, there's certainly behaviors and, and and reckless behavior that's gone on within the ad tech space. But you could say that within any industry, right? So I'd like to think that uh, the good has outweighed uh, the bad in allowing folks to sort of harness, uh, uh, you know, the entire medium. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is that when you start to think about things like ad blocking, right, and you talk about fraud and you talk about these things, this is not born because people are having like this great consumer experience, you know, within the medium. So I think it's on all of us in the technology space. Uh, and you know, especially in the publishing space, to really focus on uh, content, to focus on experiences, and to focus on quality uh, and return on investment over you know bombarding people with uh, with clickbait. You know, as you guys kind of saw in the in the ad about. Well, let me let me stay on this topic for all you guys. Should uh, an, an an ad exec at a, at a company that's that's engaging with uh, an agency or with an AOL uh, should they be scared? Should, I mean, it, it, are, are they right to be scared that they are potentially throwing their money away? And should we be becoming more conservative as an industry on how we advertise, sticking to things that maybe are a little bit more clear? Without question. I mean, if you look at the stats that have come out even in the last few days, it's clear that there's been an enormous amount of wastage and fraud in the broader ad space. Now, I don't, that doesn't affect most premium publishers. It doesn't, I'm sure, affect companies like AOL. But generally, yes, they should be scared's too strong a word, but they should be intensely conscious of it. You guys agree with that? Well, I think that people need to, I mean, people need to take, to acknowledge the change. And I think that there is a lot of uh, conservatism, and I think that people are quite stick, stuck to traditional ways to spend money, which is normal because everyone is in their comfort zone. So basically, you do what you know yeah. very well. And this is very much unknown. So. Sure you need to be taking risk, and I think you need to be brave enough to uh, confront with a new world and with new form of advertising. So when it comes to branded content, when it comes to experiential content, when it comes to things that really resonate into people, that's where you need to explore, and in the same time, start to put together the metrics that are going to really help. But the good news is that digital is underpinned by data, so it's not that difficult to uh, 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 have the real-time return on experiences. So I think that it's, a, it's also a question for agencies to push um, brands to really experience those kind of uh, new ways. And coming back to what you said about ad blocking, I think that when the message is in the content and that the content is engaging because it is meaningful, then you are not blocked. And everybody knows yeah. that. So it's just a question of it, um, evolving. And what you said before about how to adapt that from talents. I think that one thing is very important within the Havas uh, mindset it is that it, we break the silos. We really bring the media into the creative and the creative into the media in real terms because we have the village concept, so it's really happening. And that helps uh, people that are dealing with data, with the media, to really bring um, messages that are really meaningful, that are really uh, relevant and the creative to create their message for the people to really um, consider this message as part of the content, not just as something that comes out of the blue. And I think this is really where the shift should go. It's really the collision of um, content and advertising, and I think we should learn a lot from uh, the entertainment business because engaging audience and making sure that people are really um, ready to consume content 
is exactly where we should go through brand messaging. But that means, again, losing the comfort zone where you buy space that is completely there, you know the price, you know how to uh, manage this kind of media planning and going into something which is much more complicated. Janet, I want to ask you a couple questions because we're, I mean, we're, we're very lucky to have the CMO of DraftKings on, I think, with you because I think in many ways there's no bigger story, at least for the past couple months, right. than what we're seeing between DraftKings and FanDuel. Just some statistics I have, legal sports report estimates, you've spent more than $100 million on TV commercials alone this year. There have been some weeks where you've outspent every other company. Is this healthy? Um, healthy for the business? Or yep. the, yes. Uh, so I think one of the things when you talk about should advertisers be scared, you know, one of the reasons we're, we're not scared is, is that we do a tremendous job of measuring all of our advertising, including our broadcast. We have very sophisticated systems on how we do that measurement. Um, and we were in the market very, very aggressively for three weeks, and those three weeks were the two weeks before, prior to NFL um, season started and then the week one of the NFL. It's the most important time of year for us as a company. Uh, we needed to be out ahead. We needed to be out ahead of our competition. Uh, we needed to make sure everyone knew how to play DraftKings and what DraftKings is all about. Uh, we believe that we executed very well on that three-week strategy. Uh, can I say that was everyone really happy to see DraftKings everywhere? Um, it wasn't everyone. There were certainly people making some comments, um, people dreaming about DraftKings ads and, um, you know, other funny comments and other comments that, you know, maybe it's gotten a little bit too much. Uh, but we really monitor results and we also monitor brand, um, you know, kind of effects on the brand. And right now, although there's a couple of people making a little noise, I would say from a business standpoint, it was very healthy and we're really happy with the way we executed. Is part of what we have seen from you guys simply an arms race with FanDuel? In other words, do you feel like that's your limiting factor? You've got to get out ahead of them in order to capture the market? Well, FanDuel definitely had a few year lead on us. Um, and we're happy that we've taken over the leadership position in a short period of time. Um, and I think at this point, for me, it's more around growing the overall space than a lot of focus on uh, FanDuel because, you know, I believe that anyone that plays season long uh, needs to understand weekly and probably will enjoy the weekly game even more than season long games. There's a lot of advantages around weekly and daily. So I, I really believe that what I'm, my goals are around expanding uh, the people that are playing um, and making that audience as big as we can and as big as we believe it can be. I'm our tech media telecom m and reporter, so I have to ask you this. Would it be easier if you just merged with FanDuel? Um, it's not something we're um, against. Okay. You know, so I will say that. I, um, it's not something that we're actively pursuing, but it's not something we would be against. I think that there, um, you know, I, I do think that if we don't see a little bit more separation between the companies uh, in this year, I don't necessarily think we're doing ourselves, we're doing the industry the best service to the industry exactly. by competing so aggressively when there's probably room for two of us in this very large space. What percentage of sales do you kick back into advertising? Um, yeah, it's, I, we don't disclose it, but, you know, it's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it must be. <laughs> and and it's mean. a lot, of the, you know, and it's even more so this, this time of year. Trevor, I want to turn to you because it's sort of on, in, in some ways, I suppose, in the opposite spectrum, a brand new company in DraftKings, a company we all know in the Wall Street Journal and certainly Dow Jones. How has the world changed for you? Uh, I mean, you, you came from Bloomberg and have been at the Journal, certainly. Yep. So, even, you know, either either at the Journal or just really throughout your your career in these two industries, sort of already, how are you dealing with an obvious, people don't read the newspaper as much and so forth, but, but I'm sure there's more, uh, you know, uh, detailed changes and sort of how are you adjusting? Yeah, good, great question. And I didn't know it was coming, so um, let me try and answer that in three ways. I think as a company, we're spending a lot of time and effort getting to know our customers really well. And by customers, I mean readers. Building up that data amongst our readership is one of our core priorities, so we know that. Um, not just so that we can target better advertising at them, though that's part of the reason, but helps us in our subscription drive. So that's one part. Secondly, um, and probably the thing I think about most of all is, to Kathleen's point earlier, is talent. You know, the thing I've learned over the X years in this business 
is that great salespeople really do make a difference. And for the salespeople in this audience, um, I think you guys are in a great position in the coming years. There are going to be a lot of companies looking to make a difference by the quality of the people that they hire. Um, and then thirdly, it's product. How do we look to introduce innovative products? I, I think the word disruptive is overused in the media business. I think disruptions are few and far between. And I think most of us should set our sights at constantly innovating and coming up with new and better ways of doing things that aren't necessarily hugely disruptive, that don't turn an industry upside down, but actually deliver better results for advertisers and better results for consumers. Uh, Don, I want to return a little bit to that, to the Bloomberg mm. cover story, which, by the way, if you haven't read it, is about how uh, a lot of the traffic online uh, that companies think that they're uh, buying a matter of human beings are not. And it's fact, in fact, machines are generating this traffic. Uh, how are you, how is AOL sort of dealing with, with the problem in general? Yeah, I think um, one of the interesting places that we find ourselves in is that you know we're, we're a major ad tech player, but we're also a huge publisher, right? So I, I think you know the, the heritage as a publisher, uh, whether you go back to the old school AOL days or more recently, you know TechCrunch and Gadget, Huffington Post, so on and so forth, um, being a publisher allows us uh, a unique perspective uh, in the market. Right, so you know, uh, one of the things I talked about a little bit earlier was was sort of point solutions coming in and being neat products, but are they businesses? There isn't a sort of fraud detection or bot, you know, uh, prevention software. There isn't one in the industry that hasn't come our way, right? And and the ability to to sort of test all these folks in a real live environment and do you know really head to head to look at what is viable, what isn't viable. Um, you know, and I can say that again, this is part of this I think is it's a very real problem that publishers need to address, but it's also there's money to be made in fear, right? And you know, you get folks riled up um, you know, about this and, and there's, a, there's a couple cents per dollar to take out of the equation, right? So I think that that's, that's part of it. Uh, and you know, the Verizon acquisition for us was big in a sense that uh, we understand at a device level or at a, a consumer level, these are real people. Right? And so I think that uh, you know, that ability to police an audience at, at that type of granularity, uh, to maintain a lot of one-to-one -one publisher relationships, hold publishers, third parties accountable, as well as ourselves, and, and incorporate the best tech that we can in the space to, to, to detect that, has allowed us to, to really uh, you know, play fairly clean in the ecosystem. You have to keep looking at it every day, every hour, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a solvable problem uh, from my perspective. You mentioned briefly Go90. Tell us a little bit about sort of how that's developing. If you can, take us a little bit under the hood on that. Yeah, Where are we here? And, sure. So we yeah. just launched that uh, on Monday night. Had, a, had an event uh, down at the, the seaport to launch that. Um, really interesting product from Verizon. It is a, uh, an OTT service, uh, premium content uh, featuring you know, the likes of the NFL. Uh, differentiators in it really is that it's, it's going to be a very social-led uh, offering and really targeted towards a millennial audience, uh, and it's free, right? So it's going to be, uh, uh, be downloaded onto, uh, onto Verizon devices starting uh, this week, uh, tomorrow, I believe, uh, and it's a free offer. And it's not below where it's, it, folks can delete it off there, but uh, we're really getting a, an interesting uh, response from, from marketers. Uh, publicists signed on for a large deal with us for a, a Q4 uh, exclusive, and um, you know we'll be scaling it out to, to the rest of the market in Q1. But we're really, really excited. Uh, combination of curated uh, content as well as original content as well. And this is already integrated with sort of the programmatic ad technology. It, it will be through Q4. It will be yeah. through Q4. Yeah. The, the idea then is to make uh, this uh, the data and everything available through a one platform and allow advertisers to really do some interesting segmentation and targeting of the, of the audience. Uh, Lucian, you're, I know you're creating a lot of sort of the content, the new campaigns for brands. How is the world changing in terms of what people want to engage with? Well, <clears throat> I think that, again, uh, we, we need to learn from where people used to consume content, which is more, which is closer to Hollywood than to um, Madison Avenue, in a way. So I think that we need also to get where the great franchise, the great... Uh, stories are really uh, sourced. And I think that the content is one thing. The source of content is more important. So everything we've done, which learn from the, the, the real authentic content that really people are passionate about, 
have been successful. So the key word here is passion. People are really defining their um, focus by what they really like, what they've chosen, which is their passion. And basically, coming back to the bot concept, the problem is as soon as you have real people, and if you get through data in what people like, you know it's real people, mm -hmm. and you can really have a, a better way to define what they really are, so you can also use that as a profiling. So again, I think that, and, and the Unstem industry has been quite good to do that, because basically when you create a story and you start to have fans, then you have a, a community of people that are quite consistent and you can address with a message that is going to be really spot on. And one great uh, example of that is uh, music, because we talk about stories and, and, and I mean, passion, but music is one of the main passion for everyone, even if there are different genres. People would really love music, and that's something that is part of their life. So we have created this um, alliance with Universal Music Group, which is called the um, Global Music Data Alliance. And what we do with that is we really um, explore through the fanship of those artists that are absolutely massive, but there are millions of people, but each of those people are fans that are absolutely individual. They, they, are, they are real, and they, they express why they are fans, because there are different types of uh, logics of engagement, so it's quite clear. And what you can do through data is really having the way to, to uh, address these people with the right story. So content is going to be driven by anything you learn from the fans when it comes to something that is really meaningful to them, which is passion. So again, I think that content can't be just tried and because you want to, let's say, launch a product or sell a product, you're going to push a message that comes from your product. It starts with the consumer, and it starts with what consumer wants to hear, which is basically what they're ready to consume, branded or not branded. And then the brand has to find a meaningful role within this part, but it has to come from what people really want. So and think, when they want it. And when they want it, yeah. exactly. Kathleen, how has the broader industry disruption disrupted what you do? In other words, are you looking for different things today in different roles than you were a year or two ago? I think so. We do a piece of research at the Lighthouse every year. We do about 1,000 CEOs that we um, question. And what's becoming really clear is actually what we call, what we've kind of termed horizontal hybrids. So people that have got a good understanding of lots of different facets. So if you were many years ago just a television trader or just a digital trader, whatever it may be, you're becoming a little bit in danger because if you are not aware of what else is happening around your organizations and you're connecting up to some of those things, you can find yourself quite isolated in a, in a dark corner. So we're finding some people are becoming, dare I say, obsolete. Some of the people that haven't really been curious enough to see what's coming next or have expanded their role beyond something that was quite traditional. So there are people in quite big jobs that are coming to us, let's say they get suddenly made redundant or there's a merger of businesses or something, uh, and actually they're going to struggle to be competitive in the market. So I worry for those people. We're definitely seeing some of that. We talked about lateral movement before, that's there. But I think you know, it comes back to human innate traits. You know, I'm a psychotherapist as well, so I'm interested always in how someone's mind approaches these things and if you have that level of curiosity or bravery and a passion for something you will try you, you will investigate more it's those that are quite close to sort of not on my watch that I think have done damage to the industry and actually are now finding themselves far less attractive so that that has had an impact and I think that we are far more open I think as individuals now to be to be approached about or to consider very different types of roles than we used to be. It, it's really incredible for me how many people... I was just saying in the green room to Trevor in the UK, you know, the new CRO for The Telegraph, one of our big newspapers out there, is actually an agency CEO who's never, ever sold anything in a traditional sales sense in his life. And he's a great hire. So I think that people are much more open-minded. But again, this fortune favours the brave keeps coming up. You've got to be curious and you've got to be brave. So let's, in a panel about disruption, let's talk about what the next big thing is. Is it wearables? Is it something else? Is it sort of Michael Wolff's point where, like, television is the new, you know, the Internet? In other words, is there no next big thing for the next few years? Next big thing is audience choice, to the point earlier I think Lucian made. That's the next big thing. We've all got to put our, we've all got to structure our businesses around the fact that the consumer is going to be filtering out a lot of advertising, a lot of messaging, 
And those of us that thrive and survive will be the people who can adapt their businesses to cope with that. I don't think it's about any means of delivery per se. I mean, if you look at it, we, wearables are hard. It's very hard, I think, to get a very compelling advertising message of any great substance across the wearable devices we're seeing. And that'll get harder as wearables get smaller and smaller. And that is absolutely going to happen. We're going to see the notion of a wearable is going to dematerialize. So advertising on that's going to be difficult. No, I think it's about understanding that consumers are sometimes going to opt for interu interruptive messaging, but many times they're going to want to choose which adverts they see and when, and are probably going to engage in a swap of value for it, either with data or with cash. Do you guys agree with that, that, that wearables, yeah. it's, it's going to be difficult to advertise? Because certainly there's another school of thought that says, oh, that's going to change everything. But to Trevor's point, there seems to be some major challenges. I hear some more excitement around virtual reality. Virtual reality seems to be a place that lots of my candidates are asking me about and very, very curious around how they can get into that world. It would appear that that appears to be tickling people's fancy when it comes to what they may see coming next and how advertising could well play an engaging part of that for sure. So again, what do I know? I'm only a headhunter, but I, what I'm hearing from the, from the market is where people want to go, and that's definitely coming up at the moment quite heavily. Do they give you any specifics on what exactly they're looking to do in a virtual It's to reality? literally take, you know, there's obviously lots of engineers and products that are coming up and through this market. It's people that want to go and lead those businesses and make them proper businesses and actually bring them to market in a, in a fulsome way. So from a general management and commercial level, that's what they're interested in doing. It's, just, it's an odd corner, but it seems to be quite proactive. Whether, it, whether you're into sport or music or whatever, being able to experience some of these things, even though you're not there, appears to be incredibly pertinent to people. Uh, so at DraftKings, obviously, you, I mean, your, advertisers are, your advertisements are everywhere. Cer certainly, you know, they, they explode all over. They're on Twitter. They're on fantasy sports pages online. How are you sort of divvying up your budget, and, and how are you looking ahead constantly to make sure that you're available on all these different platforms that people use DraftKings on? Sure. Um, you know, the number one me measurement is the CPA for, you know, the cost per deposit. And uh, we look at those and stank rank, rank them. And, uh, and sometimes, sometimes of the year, the broadcast is more effective than the digital spend. Sometimes digital is. Um, we're doing a lot with content integration as well, uh, some of that paid. Um, and we measure that. It, the beauty of having a business that, that is online, you know kind of when something spikes in the market, you can go look and say, did, you know, what did we get? What happened you know, in that hour when these ads ran? And then you know specifically on the digital side. Um, so for us, it's, it's just we're looking at media mix, um, and we're focusing on the media for when it's most efficient in the marketplace. And how are you making the decision to get bigger? In other words, you know, you guys are obviously you're taking strategic investments. Some of those uh, are public and have been revealed. It's starting to get to be big dollars. Your company's growing. How are you deciding now is the right time to get bigger, et cetera? Yeah, we do believe, uh, to answer kind of your earlier question around land grab, I do, we do believe we are in a land grab. What, what I'm not convinced of is that we're in a land grab against FanDuel. We're in a land grab about growing this very interesting category. And, you know, we've got, you know, we've got these investments and we might as well put them to use and make sure that we're getting as many people playing as quickly as they're playing. Um, and the other thing is, is as we acquire people for NFL, then we have these 17 other sports that, that, that we can then market to them all throughout the year. And so, again, acquiring big numbers now and maximizing the lifetime value of those players coming through, and we really believe the right time was to do it right exactly when we did it. Uh, to, to that end, I want to talk a little bit about what you guys think in terms of the differences between being a public company and being a private company. Do you feel like uh, public companies are very much hindered in comparison because they need to make quarterly results and they have analysts beating down their necks and maybe some of, the, some of what they can do creatively is stulted because they are public companies. Yes, um, so although you know, I'm not going to comment specifically on any timing for an IPO for us, what I can tell you uh, after working for multiple uh, private companies that subsequently went public, um, you know, it is it changes the game and it makes it maybe that you are 
too focused on those short-term results and not able to make the investments that would really help grow your business. You guys agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it, 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 a lot of it's cultural, though. You know, I mean, it's, we're, it, if you have the right people, you're all accountable to something. You know, having been in a, in a startup environment that's sold, having been in a, you know, a larger company that was just bought, uh, you know, there's always someone to answer to, right? And then whether it's, the, you know, whether it's uh, your board, your investors, the street, so on and so forth, I think it's are you accountable uh, to those that you know, are counting on you to perform? And you know, I think that's the, that's the, at the end of the day, I don't, there's different pressures. The pressures are different being public. You know, our, our pressures today as, as AOL are a little bit different than they were you know, six months ago, but there's still a heck of a lot of pressure. So I would just go back to one thing, though, on the disruptive thing, and I don't know what folks think, but, you know, it's almost like a, a sort of a weird way to look at it, but, uh, you know, to your comment about, and I forget the gentleman's name, he said that ad tech was the worst thing that in human history or whatever it was advertising or whatever it was, I, <laughs> that I remember. That's pretty much it. But um, <laughs> I almost look at transparency as a disruptor, right, and accountability as a disruptor. We've actually invested a lot of money in um, things like multi-touch attribution. Right? And if you can start to use this medium to point to an accountable metric or, or measurement that really looks at the entire spectrum of all spend and all media, does that transparency and, and like a level of transparency that none of us had a decade ago, how does that disrupt the marketplace? Right? And how does that disrupt uh, where we spend our money and when we spend our money and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, we can talk, but with Verizon, I've learned a lot about, you know, Internet of Things. I mean, there's some really cool stuff they're doing, you know, but that's down the road. You know, what is it we can do now uh, from a transparency perspective to disrupt things in a positive way and in an efficient way, I think is, is sort of what we need to challenge ourselves on. Um, I think it's more about the culture. I agree. I think I've just, I work for a public company. I was working for a private company. I think both are at a significant disadvantage when they're at scale and they're competing with an iconoclastic company mm. that has no alternative but to disrupt an industry and hasn't got an existing revenue stream or profitability to protect. And I think that's a real challenge for all of us who are at large companies is it's very easy as a disruptor to be destructive and not necessarily constructive and creative and creating value. And I think we wrestle with that. I, I would argue there's... One of the really interesting things about ad blockers is it will force us as an industry to take excess capacity out of the marketplace, which is both good for advertisers um, and, good, and good for the publishing companies themselves. I'm looking, at, I'm looking around this room. I think I'm probably the youngest person on this panel. There aren't that many people here <laughs> that I are... I think we all, dis we all disagree, <laughs> by the way. That, that hey. are younger yeah. than, uh, you know, that, let's say that are in their teenage years, but I feel fairly confident in saying that the younger people get, the more annoyed they are with advertising because they get in a way, they get in the way of content. I couldn't disagree more. Why? I, rem I remember my grandfather, this is years ago, walking down the high street in England, turning his carrier bag inside out. I went to high out. your grandfather. Did you? <laughs> you Old folks up here. Uh, but, you know, he used to turn his carrier bags inside out because he didn't want to advertise the shop he was with. Right? And I remember passionately my grandmother complaining about the fact that there was four minutes of AdWords on IT, ads on ITV in those days. People have always loathed bad advertising, mm -hmm. and they've always loved good advertising. And I don't think it's got anything to do with genera generations. I think what we have lost in the past few years is actually some of the great advertising that we've made. And I think one of the interesting shifts in power in the coming years is you're going to see more power coming back to truly creative, good advertising. It's going to get cheaper to make. We're already seeing that. The cost of making a 30-second commercial is less than it was. It'll get cheaper and cheaper, and it will get more targeted but, and better. But does the form need to change also? Uh, so my children are 18 and 16, so I, I'll speak, if I can, for them, because I'm obviously incredibly ancient. My children don't mind advertising, but they're very, very smart to what you're doing. So trying to sneak up on them with something, whether it's on Snapchat or wherever else, they're fully cognizant of what you're doing. To your point, and actually I'm sure in Lucian's world, particularly the universal music thing that you're doing, I think that as long as it's appropriate, as long as it's entertaining and good quality, then they absolutely adore it. But it's this slightly sneaky sort of way of sort of sneaking adverts up on them. They find highly irritating and they're super smart to it. I, by the way, I'd like to say, the notion that branded content is going to be the savior of the advertising world is the biggest loan of baloney I've heard. In years, <coughs> right? It's not scale. It, it's great for some, for some clients with a great story, but there are so many clients with commoditized products who, can't, who haven't got a great branded story to tell. 
and we, we are, I think, deluding ourselves and them if we think so, that we can so, put them into content and so consumers. Give, can... give me an example of good creative advertising that's not television advertising. Can I be... Can I talk... Or magazine or newspaper. In other words, mobile or internet. Um, I think Netflix has done extraordinary work across a number of partners promoting its TV series with really good content, um, with us, with the New York Times, with The Atlantic. I don't want to single us out for praise there. I think they've done very, very good content there. I look at what Nike's done. I mean, it's, it's products. It's the, the ability to wear that on wearables, for example, is mm. true advertising, but it's incredibly useful for the consumer. Um, and I think they're two good examples. I can give you an example of what we've done for Coca-Cola on... Um, you know, they, they, they really are committed to create some uh, opportunities for young people to uh, practice and exercise and so forth. So they partner with Ubisoft franchise called Just Dance. And it was an app called Just, Just Dance Now. And this created an amazing video on how you could dance and how you could follow the screen. And this video has been uh, 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 distributed freely on the internet 12 million times in yep. a few days. And that was a much more powerful way to um, you know, communicate than the traditional type of media. As long as people were able to really use it and actually re-edit it. Because the, the first um, edition was completely changed by people. So it's also a question of how people will participate in the advertising. One thing that I wanted to say about description is more and more it's about not just a message, but an experience. And I think that it's very important to help people to um, embrace the message and own it and, in a way, share it with their own input on it. So it's also about how people will really be able to be uh, invited to be part of something. I think that what is wrong about advertising, even if it is a, a, an excellent advertising, it is when it is uh, intruding something and, and breaking something. This is what I said before. Breaking the break is certainly the way to go through these problems, and especially with the youngest. I think that I also have uh, young um, uh, children, I mean, young adult children, I would say. They, 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 they like advertising, but if they like one, they are going to share it with friends and make comments and maybe read it. They are not going to be uh, exposed to the same ad like 25 times and the, the kind of repetition, all the mm -hmm. techniques of advertising we had when we carpet bomb this kind of thing is over. They, they, they don't go for it. And, you know, when they want to watch uh, music videos, they, they, they just can't wait for the skip button to go to what they want. But, so, but how much of that's an economic question then, in a sense that you know, I was at somebody's home this past weekend and they had Pandora on in the house, yeah, yeah. you know? And uh, commercials were coming on, of course, and, and, and uh, complaining. They're sort of lamenting. Wow, they, there's more ads than there used to be on Pandora. I said, well, you know, there's a version where you pay, yeah. and they don't have any ads. And he goes, oh, that's like 100 bucks a year. I don't want to do that. I said, well, Pandora is a, a business. <laughs> They're trying to make money. So it's either you're going to hear some ads or you're going to pay the submodel, right? But, you know, it's interesting to, to understand sort of whether folks will go that paywall you know, for, for content on a daily basis. If it's good and valuable, they will. The right. problem is we've seen a lot of businesses created in the last few years that who don't generate content that's right. good and valuable. And those businesses are in real trouble. Right. And I'd like to give an example around broadcast, because you said you kind of implied that maybe broadcast isn't, you know, a good place. But for DraftKings, again, kind of building an industry, uh, we've got seven different broadcast ads out in the marketplace with different messaging and different creative. And it's all around teaching people, you know, why you would want to play uh, and the excitement of winning. Um, but there's also all the education around how do you play. And people are really interested in the space, but we're helping to teach them through our broadcast spend on how to play. Sure, and, and I wasn't implying that broadcast wasn't a good place to put money. Actually, I was implying sort of the opposite, where it was like, that seems like a tried and true place where you can put money. What, what seems more uh, iffy to me is a non-engaging uh, viral video on mobile or the internet, something that interrupts. And that's where I want to get back to where we started, sort of with Kathleen, what we were saying. Because a lot of what we're talking about here, what you just said, Lucian, about, about interrupting advertising that gets in the way, it exists like crazy in today's world. So we're not there yet. I'm flooded by it, constantly getting rid of stuff I don't want to see. So when are we going to get there where the things that you're talking about really rule the day and all the clutter gets out? Will we get there? We will get there. 
I think, without sounding overly pessimistic, I think ad blocking is going to have an enormous impact on a large number of the long tail publishers. I think that, um, to Don's point, you're going to see a number of companies put up pay models so that advertisers, so that consumers can bypass an enormous amount of advertising. Um, I think you're going to see a some kind of accommodation between those companies that create ad blockers and consumers about how much ad block, how much advertising is allowed through. I think they'll become more porous than they are in the, than they are now. Um, and I think you'll see advertising, if you will, toned down. But I still think it'll be interruptive. And I don't think there's anything wrong with interruptive advertising as long as it's good and as long as it's respectful. There's nothing worse than an autoplay video. Right? That's right. really irritating. Right. But, if, but an ad halfway down an article that is somewhat relevant, that's fine. You can, deal, you can deal with that. And I think we're all attuned to what is interrupted and what is irritating, and they're two different things. Well, I think, too, if you think about consumption, just the way that folks are utilizing tablets and, and, and you know, smartphones and you know, smart TV apps at this point versus even, say, three, four, five years ago, it's significant. You know, I think one of the next consumer backlashes, and it's something that we're talking to, is that you know, as, as you start to look at the cord cutters, is the data costs yep. for viewing the, those ads, Absolutely. right? And, you know, something we're discussing with advertisers as far as a, subsidi a subsidizing plan, you know, data as a, as a service um, to make sure that consumers, you know, understand that, hey, you're not going to have to watch this GM ad on your dime, right? And Because I, I think that's something that you'll start to hear quite a bit of as, as folks consume content on, on tablets. We've got, like, two and a half minutes. Are there any questions in the audience here for our esteemed panel that you guys want to chime in on? So let me ask We're the old, so speak up. Let me ask the audience a question. How many of you are using ad blockers? Put up your hands if you're using ad blockers. I guess everybody works in media and no one's to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. How many of you are paying for a subscription service that so you, so that you don't have to listen to advertisements? And that's at ad week, right? Yep. <laughs> this change right. is profound, right? It really yep. is gonna yep. change everything we do. Any final thoughts from you guys? Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you.